This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu Ewart. It's Wednesday, December 18th. This is Africa 54. A United Nations-sponsored Global Refugee Forum wraps up Wednesday. We'll have the latest from Geneva. VOA has an in-depth interview with the 2019 CNN Hero of the Year, Prewin Mebratu. And a tech startup has a goal to distribute food to those in need. The United Nations Agency for Refugees calls the last decade tumultuous as an unprecedented 70 million people were forcibly displaced due to war, persecution or violence. A UN-sponsored global refugee forum helping to address critical issues is wrapping up Wednesday in Geneva. The UN says governments can help by welcoming and investing in refugees. But what does this work look like on the ground? Can it be as simple as installing solar panels or encouraging schoolgirls in Kakuma refugee camp? We hear more from VOA's Ayen Dengbio. It's 5 a.m. at the Angelina Jolie School in Kakuma refugee camp. The sun is yet to rise, but the students have already started their 12-hour day. The day's agenda is as ambitious as the students themselves. Most aspire to become doctors, poets, and even prime ministers and presidents. Being a president in this school, it has encouraged me to have a big dream of serving my people wherever I will be. It doesn't matter. To be a refugee, you can't succeed in life. But for me, to be a refugee is that the opposite of an insult. It is a badge of strength, courage, and victory. Those dreams can sometimes feel out of reach as young refugees in the camp wrestle with limited resources amid underfunded UN refugee programs and a record-breaking global refugee crisis. So students often go without basic school supplies, teachers work in overcrowded classrooms, and these limitations can literally leave camp residents in the dark. Kilometers away from Kenya's power grid, just 5% of the combined 250 residents have electricity. The introduction of solar power has helped, but progress has been slow. In the camp, there is, after primary, secondary school, there is, there is no chance maybe to go to, to do higher education. But if there is internet here, and then it can it help us even open door for, for us to do further education and have chance at least to, to have more skills and, and do so many things. The 250 students at the Angelina Jolie School and their teachers also think education is key to a better future. When you look at the world, um, well, once you are educated, you, you can get jobs, you can have a voice to talk even in front of men, you can become the president of your country, you can have power to speak out and say your rights, especially the rights of girls. You can fight for, for your country. And once you have that power, it is going to help you to move to places in the world and do many things. Stakeholders gathering at the Global Refugee Forum are diligently trying to find solutions and funding to address global refugee needs. Ayan Dengbior, VOA News, Washington. Now, for more on the World Refugee Forum, BOS Lisa Brandt joins us live via Skype from Geneva, Switzerland. Good evening, Lisa. Hi, good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you. Sure. The forum is almost over. What's the takeaway message? Well, the takeaway message is that everybody needs to step up and um, support refugees. Um, that means the private sector, foundations, uh, individuals, and obviously governments, both host governments as well as donor governments. Um, the UNHCR appears to have gotten something like 70 pledges so far to date. We do not yet know what the, um, you know, the exact amount, or at least the last time I checked. Um, 
Um, I think that will be coming out later, um, but apparently not always uh, cash, but also in kind. That said, uh, a number of private sector uh, corporations and other maybe foundations as well have stepped up, and we knew this at the beginning, something like $250 million in pledges, um, mm -hmm. and also programs like training refugees and giving them language skills and um, and other things. So it's really the idea, par partly, I think, is simply to raise awareness, um, have a more inclusive message at a time where, you know, doors are shutting in a number of different countries in the world, yeah. and, and to have a more comprehensive strategy. Now, Lisa, uh, what are Africans asking for? Well, you know, I did talk to a number of uh, different sort of races of Africa yesterday, and as well as today. Um, I spoke with a couple of delegates, one from Cameroon, one from Ethiopia, spoke with a refugee, and um, also a few experts. So, you know, obviously the asks are different. Um, the African refugee, um, among others, was, it was a real, you know, I mean, he was fighting um, for a greater voice for refugees. He's from the Democratic Republic of Congo. He now works in Uganda, and he's helping other refugees get back onto their feet, especially women and girls. So he wants a greater voice for refugees on matters that really count for them. Um, countries like Ethiopia, Cameroon, which are hosting many refugees, are saying, we need more money from donor nations. Mm -hmm. um, experts are saying, we need a number of different things. Um, you know, we need uh, support for having clean energy in refugee camps. We need better coordination among all the stakeholders. Um, we need to have um, also a more inclusive strategy um, by countries that are hosting refugees, um, where, whether they right. are you know, in Europe or in Africa. All right, Lisa. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Lisa Brandt reporting live for us via Skype from Geneva. Now, a total of 2.6 million people displaced in Somalia are expected to face major humanitarian crises in the coming years and are in urgent need of assistance from the international community. The displaced people are one-fifth of Somalia's total population, over 500,000 of whom are gathered in and around Mogadishu, posing a major threat to the stability of that city. Nearly 1,000 displaced people live in a temporary settlement 40 kilometers west of the capital. 51-year-old Adan Abdi has lived there for about three years. A decade ago, he was forced to leave his hometown in the south due to rampant terrorist activities. We face not only poverty, but also fear and insecurity. The extremist groups like Al-Shabaab make us feel we are in danger anytime and anywhere, whether you are in a restaurant or on the road. They poison the mind of the young and control them to make explosions and kill people around the country. Terrorism has hindered international humanitarian aid. We've had enough of horror. Now, last month, the Forum of the African Union Convention for the Protection and Assistance of Internally Displaced Persons in Africa called for the protection of the rights of displaced people in Somalia. Frewin Mebratu was named 2019 CNN Hero of the Year. She produces a patented reusable menstrual pad for girls in her native Ethiopia, where menstruation is a taboo. Here is VOA Salem Solomon. Froeni Mebratu remembers when she returned to her home village in northern Ethiopia and saw women squatting over holes in the ground. Without any sanitary pads to use during their menstrual periods, they were stuck in this undignified position. How is that possible? And, uh, and they were telling me that they don't even use underwear. And that was the, the most turning point for me. I kind of felt, you know, the nerves going from head to, the, to my toes. And that's when I said, you know, I've got to do something. Why is this thing bothering me over and over again? So that was it. The more she examined the problem, the bigger it appeared. Two out of every five girls have been forced to miss school during their periods, with many eventually dropping out. Grown women were resorting to using old cloth or grass as pads. Women and girls, she found, were being shamed by their community during their menstrual periods. We're talking about always gender equality and all that stuff, but when the basic necessity of a, of a young girl is not fulfilled, how is that possible? 
-hmm. How is that possible? Mm -hmm. How is the country even going to be developed when 50% of your society, women, are compromised this way? It, it, is, it is crazy. In 2009, Faroini founded Mariam Saba Products Factory in Ethiopia's northern city of Magale. The factory produces reusable pads that can last up to 18 months and cost 90% less than disposable pads. Faroini has teamed up with a charitable organization, Dignity Period, and together they have distributed more than 150,000 free menstrual hygiene kits produced by the factory. The work is having an impact. Dignity Period has recorded a 24% increase in attendance by girls in schools where they offer services. This month, Froeni was selected as the CNN Hero of the Year and will receive $100,000 to support her work. She said the award was an affirmation of a decision she made years ago to move, along with her three-year-old daughter from the U.S. back to Ethiopia to pursue this cause. Today, her daughter is 18 and going off to college. You know, uh, it was the, the moment uh, of uh, an amazing journey and uh, people thought that I was uh, crying because uh, of the whole event. But it's the whole uh, timing issue was just, it must have been God's willing mm -hmm. to, to happen uh, the, the way it happened. But she says her work is not done. She noted that there are 30 million women of reproductive age in Ethiopia and the vast majority do not have access to affordable sanitary pads. Additionally, there is a 15% value added tax on many menstrual hygiene products. Uh, it's not just uh, uh, Ethiopia, it's everywhere uh, developing countries, even in the US there is a tax issue. So we seriously, now that uh, CNN has made it uh, an issue that for anybody to look at this seriously and we hope that uh, everyone will make a sensible uh, solution and a sensible change in making this a reality for all. Solemn Solomon, VOA News, Washington. The Democratic controlled U.S. House of Representatives is moving closer to a historic vote on impeaching President Donald Trump. The House is expected to spend up to six hours Thursday debating the impeachment articles that accuse Trump of abusing the powers of the presidency. Meanwhile, anti-Trump protesters rallied in New York and other U.S. cities. Here is VOA's Michael Sullivan. The House of Representatives is moving toward a likely Wednesday vote on two articles of impeachment, which would lead to Trump's trial in the Senate and possible removal from office. In New York, Los Angeles, and other U.S. cities, protesters said they want Trump out of office. Trump is the fourth U.S. president to face the constitutional process of impeachment. It's a hoax. The whole impeachment thing is a hoax. Uh, we look forward to getting on to the Senate. Uh, we're not entitled to lawyers. We're not entitled to witnesses. We're not entitled to anything in the House. It's a total sham. The country is closely divided over impeaching and removing Trump, but this protester wants to hear the evidence. Um, Trump is entitled to all the due process he wants. He should just show up and testify. At issue, whether Trump threatened to withhold American taxpayer funds earmarked for Ukraine to dig up dirt on a rival, Democrat Joe Biden. They took a perfect phone call that I had with the president of Ukraine an absolutely perfect call. You know it. They all know it. Uh, nothing was said wrong in that call. To impeach the president of the United States for that is a disgrace. As Congress moves toward a vote in the House of Representatives, where Democrats dominate, these protesters want to make their voices heard. Their strength in numbers, hopefully. More than 40 percent of Americans agree with President Trump that the impeachment hearings are politically motivated. Conviction in the Senate is not likely because the president's Republican allies hold a majority there. Mike O'Sullivan, VOA News, Los Angeles. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come. 
All eyes will be on Los Angeles Thursday as seven Democratic presidential candidates hold their final presidential debate of this year. We'll be back. Welcome back. Poaching is a major threat to the survival of elephants in Africa. VOA has reported on how the U.S. military is helping to train park rangers who are fighting to protect the enormous animals. VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Bob reports from Gabon on where park rangers are risking their lives in the counter-poaching fight. It takes about nine hours on bumpy dirt roads to get to Lope National Park. Each bend a potential for peril or a chance encounter with Gabon's majestic animals. The very wildlife these park rangers, called eco guards, are defending. To do a job like this, it takes a lot of physical effort, it takes a lot of sacrifice, and it takes a lot of motivation. We have a duty to preserve this ecosystem, this nature, this biodiversity for future generations like our predecessors and our elders did for us. Gabon is home to more forest elephants than anywhere else in the world. But over the last two decades, poachers have been killing these beautiful creatures by the tens of thousands. What's at stake is the future of Gabon. Gabon's Minister of Forest, Lee White, says elephant poachers have spilled across the borders to supply the illegal ivory trade. Elephant tusks sell for hundreds to thousands of dollars per kilo. We're losing two tons of ivory a month. That's about 150 elephants a month. And the more Gabon resists, the more dangerous the fight has become for the eco-guards. Until about five years ago, we'd never had any to be shot at. Now it's commonplace. Narcisse Baba Obame has survived five gunfights since becoming a ranger. And the technical director of Gabon's national parks recently survived an assassination attempt during a patrol. You know, it's a war. Uh, I am talking about band of 20 to 50 people in the forest with AK-47. Four, five, every fall, three, uh, three, seven, five, every fall. So it's complicated in forest. Officials say stopping crimes against the elephants will also stop the money fueling violence across the region. And we can trace the poachers who are killing those elephants um, back to Boko Haram. If we don't beat the poachers, Gabon will go the way of CAR. We will lose our country. And if Gabon loses control of its forest, this species of forest elephants will lose their last stronghold. Carla Bab, VOA News, Lope, Gabon. The sixth and final Democratic presidential debate of 2019 will be held Thursday in Los Angeles. Only seven of 15 candidates seeking the nomination to challenge President Trump will be on stage. VOA's Elizabeth Lee has more on the significance of this debate and the issues young student voters want to hear from the candidates. One more thing is on some students' minds at Loyola Marymount University, besides final exams. It's the big nationally televised debate that will be held on campus. Well, when I found out it was going to be on campus, my first 
My first thought was to change my flight home so I could stay. I was excited. I thought that was a really cool thing for LMU to get to host. California, with 495 delegates at stake, will play a bigger role in next year's Democratic primary battle, especially after moving up its primary election date by three months. That's one reason for the party's choice to hold the final debate in Los Angeles this year. They will be more relevant than they normally have been because in most cases, we know who the nominee will be by the time it got to California, and we were just ratifying what already had been decided. Uh, that got a little old for most Californians. And so now we're gonna be very important uh, and we'll have a, a strong say. Primary voters in California, a solidly democratic state, will be going to the polls on March 3rd, Super Tuesday, when many other states will also be holding primaries or caucuses. Another reason why the candidates are debating here is because of the money. Los Angeles is a place where candidates do not campaign so much as come for the money, to shake the money tree. The donors come from a rich variety of sources. You've got Hollywood, you've got a very strong component of the gay community. The top four contenders continue to be Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Pete Buttigieg. But analysts say keep an eye on entrepreneur Andrew Yang, who just barely qualified for the debate. He probably won't make it to the top this time, but... He's established himself as a player. So the question is not what will Yang do now, it's what will he do in the next two, four, six, eight, or ten years. You can see him being in a Democratic president's cabinet, establishing himself as a person of weight and gravitas, and sort of channeling that to something bigger in the future. Many of the Loyola Marymount students who are following the debate are focused on U.S. Senators Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. The topics that interest them are as diverse as the students' backgrounds. Texan Havana Campo studies biochemistry. The three topics in this election that concern me the most would be climate change, health care, and immigration reform. Peter Martin is a political science student from California. One thing that I feel I have not heard enough from the Democratic candidates is talking about both election security and election legitimacy because over the past several decades there have been a lot of concerns about uh, gerrymandering of congressional districts, about voter disenfranchisement through voter identification laws, things like that. English major Gabriella Jekyll from Washington State wants candidates to talk more about the issue many college students are worried about. We are starting to hear a lot more about student debt, um, issues that affect young voters, which is really important. Young and old Democratic voters will not only hit the polls in California on Super Tuesday, but also in 13 other states, including Texas. The results could determine who will run against President Trump in the general election next November. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News, Los Angeles. As we've mentioned, the U.S. House is debating the rules for President Trump's impeachment. VOA's Patsy Wida Kuswara reports on how Trump and his allies are planning to mount a fast and aggressive defense. December is usually a time for holiday parties and cheer. Instead, the White House is gearing up for a battle. This week, the Democrat-controlled House of Representatives is expected Aye. to vote Aye. to impeach Aye. President Aye. Donald Trump on charges of abuse Aye. of power and obstruction Aye. of Congress. Aye. Trump will face trial in the Senate, where Democrats demand to hear from more witnesses, including acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney and former National Security Advisor John Bolton. They might present exculpatory evidence that helps President Trump. It may be incriminating against the president but they should be heard. So far, the White House strategy has been to stonewall and call the House investigations a sham partisan process, which has been effective in maintaining support from Trump's base. As long as he maintains his base and those people uh, do not break with the president, then the senators will think to themselves, well, it doesn't do me any good to break with the president if I'm running for re-election. Now that the process is moving to the Republican-led Senate, the White House strategy is shifting. They are now working with top Republicans to move the trial quickly and limit political damage. I've heard Mitch. I've heard Lindsey. I think they are very much on agreement on some concept. I'll do whatever they want to do. It doesn't matter. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has pledged total coordination with the administration. Critics accuse him of violating the duty to be impartial.
that's a strategy that's worked well for McConnell in the past, to go ahead and, uh, and signal his allegiances, signal what he's going to do and what he's not going to do. So he's betting that that's, in fact, what Republicans want to have him do and want to hear him say right now. Another strategy, continue to attack Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden as corrupt for allowing his son to be on the board of a Ukrainian energy company when he was vice president. No the accusations may be hurting Biden. But you, on the other hand, sent your son over there to get a job and work for a gas company. Joe Biden dismisses demands that he testify in Trump's impeachment trial as a ploy to divert attention. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News at the White House. MSNBC. It's time for our technology segment, and joining us now is Africa 54 tech reporter Paul Diho with some important news on food. Paul? Hello, hello, Esther. The world produces enough food waste to feed as many as 2 billion people each year, according to a United Nations study. A tech startup has a goal to distribute that food to those who need it the most. Matt Debo has the details. On an island in the San Francisco Bay, a small company has been quietly taking on one of the greatest challenges we face, the future of food in an age of climate change and massive waste. And they're approaching the problem through technology. What we're trying to do is lead a resource revolution to be able to change the thinking from waste into one of recovery. Timothy Childs is a virtual reality pioneer who developed machine vision equipment for NASA's space shuttle. For him, tackling the food crisis requires examining the problem in novel ways. We have to look at it systemically from the endpoints to the outpoints and revolutionize each one of those and take that solution to every market that has that particular waste. The first target for disruption? Fruits and vegetables that would otherwise be left to rot. The solution? Advanced drying systems. What that technology allows us to do is to be able to take all sorts of agricultural inputs and be able to dry them in a way that's much faster and holds better nutrients than other systems. Cosmetically challenged apples are making their way through the dryer today to end up as a product in the company's line of foods. But making chips is just the beginning. What Treasury really is about is proving the ideas by building the first prototypes and then piloting those. And they are examining every step in the food process for treasure to extract. Some of it gets converted into energy that we're actually using to run the machines with which we are treating the food in the first place. They aim to deploy these systems across the globe. But first, everything is simulated. We design buildings, processes, and equipment in computer graphics and we test drive them inside of virtual reality. And from virtual reality into something that tastes great. Matt Dibble for VOA News, San Francisco. That's a today's a Tech a Reporter. Back to you, Esther. Thank you so much, Paul. Be sure to join Paul and Diho each Wednesday for another tech segment right here on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Good night from Washington.